Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Jennifer Franklin, and I'm the Program Director of the Hudson Valley Writers' Center. I'm happy to have you with us today as we celebrate the launch of Rachel Haddison's brand new collection, Ghost Guest, as well as incredible readings from new collections by Walter and Carol and Patrick James Arrington, who's here all the way from Scotland. If this is your first time joining us for a reading, welcome. We hope you continue to come to our online readings, classes, and events. Please check out our website for the complete listing of all of our offerings. We hope some of you will return to the center for our next in-person poetry reading on Sunday, October 22nd, when we welcome Oliver de La Paz, Michael Jimenez, and Margaret Ray. I want to thank our founder, Margaret Kaffstieber, the board, our teachers, and students who are the beating heart of the center. We also want to recognize all the foundations and organizations who support us, including the Bygal Foundation, the David B. Taft Foundation, NISCA, and Arts Westchester. I also want to thank my colleagues, Sophia Bannister, Misty Yarnell, Leslie Zinna, and Christina Papadopoulos for all of their hard work. Walter and Carol lives in New York City and sometimes Alexandria, Egypt. He received a BA in linguistics from NYU and an MFA from Rutgers, New York. He was runner up in the 2021 92nd Street Y Discovery Contest and winner of the 2021 Omni Dome Open for his first book, Etymologies, selected by John Yao. About etymologies, John Yao, the judge, writes, and Carol combines extreme precision with a wild imagination. In a note at the end of the book, he writes, the etymologies in this book are correct, though not necessarily complete, sometimes poetically so. And therein, says John Yao, lies the magic of etymologies. The author seems to have made nothing up to have been what appear coolly objective throughout the writing of each study of a word's origin. And yet, despite this claim, which I do not doubt, feelings and fancifulness emerge like a swarm of genius free from many bottles at once impish, mysterious, provocative, funny, delightful, and dazzling. Please help me welcome Walter and Carol. Um, thank you for having me read, Rachel. Thank you for inviting me. Um, one thing that John Yao didn't say about the book is that I don't actually know how to pronounce all the words in it. <laughs> so I'm just going to pretend. I'll correct you. <laughs> I am not reading any of the poems in my free. It starts with an epigraph like from Matthew 7.16. You will know them by their fruits. Um, in several Semitic languages, but also Persian, um, the word desert is Sakra, Sakara. A pilgrim on his way to Lake Chad will think the oasis a double mirage. For its name comes from Kanuri Chada, meaning lake. On the edge of this lake, lake, at the end of the desert, desert, he stands with his body twinned in the water and wonders which of him is the word and which the object. The songs of the bathers, the lanterns making glyphs of the far shore, a pink conch chart whose curve suggests the whole, these call out to him. And by their pool on his heart, he knows the standing him is word, and that the object to which all he refers is his reflected self, the one so easily scattered. I would tell you of my home, said the adult, but what I call it now is called Ham in the past, and Hamas before that, and earlier a name held secret. We live between impermanences of language, building a home is settling on translation. Onion, from Old French onion, from Latin union, meaning unity, one. It is only when cut deeply that you learn what you thought was depth 
was mere repetition of surface. Each clear pane of yourself opening to another exactly the same, out of which you will never view the real thing stark in the cold air. You, who are wholly unoriginal, that cut this cause your tears. Um, I like to read this one only when I like to be like, otherwise, this would be Forest. <laughs> Brave the five burrows in search of Babel and its legendary center. In Williamsburg, they speak of Yiddish origins after an antique Google meaning rain, while Western heresiarchs counter that it was forged in Hell's Kitchen. Natives of Alphabet City only say, point to a bodega. <laughs> the markets are of little use. Amid ziggurats of spice, men rave cryptically of an almighty everything. In Turtle Bay, they confuse forest with tortoise. The jewelers of Midtown warn of a curse. The bagel's center cannot be unrivaled without breaking its brain. The gluttonous, desiring the possibilities of empty space, devour the enclosing solid. Its missing center falls out. Lost as a void among voids. Oh, yeah. From a cherry pea source, London is its creator. In the wind, the ancient body creaks like a door, opening and closing. A spotted owl poses its fancy question to the other side. How inhuman, jungle bird, to see the forest from the greens, that the blues you soar within do not soar within you, that red is the red of Catatonia and the dust you choose to sail against, that yellowing is not of age, the first light, my hibiscus, that you outfly your shades. You are like us, like this, that we call you two hand kind kana because it is how the Tupi heard your cries, and two of us have not been caged by what we routinely said. Um, the sort of centerpiece of the book comes actually like literally at the center, but uh, uh, it's a dialogue poem between two speakers, both of them unnamed. The first one, uh, I'm gonna see some punctuation marks, <laughs> I don't know how this is okay. So, speaker one, dot, 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 question mark. <laughs> speaker two. They will call you Adama, the earthling, and Adam, the maker, and Adam, the man. And later, Anamas and Namatat, each name signifying the changing nature of the branch. Come, let me show you. The tree of knowledge is the proto language whose branches grow everywhere and whose fruits bear on the tongue. Allow them to contort your mouth, mud slinger, and explain yourself. <laughs> Speaker one, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. No matter, speaker two, no matter that my tongue ports, you will either express yourself in your own terms in a language of your own make, and thus become illegible in your shifting sense. Or you will believe you are clay carved into an ideogram of the being, in a word unchanging, because in his word. In which case, you will waste your life reading your face over and over again and being sorry for the story of time. Um, it looks like I can, in the shape of a man, from an affiliate in a clean person and supreme false. Some stood motionless and turned to the wild wine. Some had the names of lovers carved deeply inside. Someone fallen made snow angels. Some did always have a hole in them. Some remained stone faced and light of the moon. Some in that the city moved the stars. Some were repurposed by a local witch. Some at the brink and never looked back. Some marked the end of themselves, some guided no traveler, some became sundials and shadows and circled their gates. Some endured the years, but collapsed through the touch of the earth. 
um, the next um, the written kind of the next bill. Um, and uh, if you take the first line and you rearrange it, to, it makes the third line. And I'm telling you because I spent a lot of time thinking. <laughs> origami from Japanese oro to fold and kami paper. Forgo the note pattern for the lily of the holiday. Mm -hmm. Maligned form is grounded in flatness, a flap of lips, Mr. Flamingo. Mm -hmm. Of sex, one unfolds breath and crap. Notice in the snow, boxes. A sawn belt, ice sheets break, a mirror lake, out a swan. Arcane, how the mind foresees and pleats a frame. Um, taboo from Tongan, taboo the sacred proto Polynesian, not to be touched and spread by unspeakable acts around the world. An ambiguous Niz in the Zula, an area the holic from Brest, a prodder of cattle from Mula, a swarm of bug chasers from Pesh, a man with bed sores in Mansora, an amplifier from Omsk, a Walid kebab in Gamora, a dick with his hairy in Tomsk, a chai boy big spooned in Mashkarga, a Luro Aslan from Tehran, a chubby chasey in Shaharga, a wap with a wap from Amman. A black tie affair in Long Phuket. Admit what you did to me. The mind that shapes the bumblebee's name out of Anamano poetic Tromblin is in turn shaped by the name of the bumblebee. Which comes to evoke in the mind afternoons of Hanan and Shahi, hypocrite, and beards and tangles. His scent, now as distant as the summer, is so ripe years in which we could not tell the bee from the bumble, and to which the bumblebee in its freakness paid no mind. In the synagogue of the Logos, a rabbi interred Geniza, those sacred texts containing his unutterable name. In a distant land, book grew out of proto-Germanic focus the beech tree. In burying what is unsayable, we allow it to take root and then cover the place. I'll read like three. Pumpernickel, from German pumpern to cast gas and make old coffin. For its unflappable properties. Heart goblin, ass kraken, puck of petarog, ghost of dinner's past, bum yet, boot, the magic dragon, deferous, undipped, urus of your anus, aureus of the asper, notus of the not me, riddle of the sphinx, will of the whip, siren, but the lady nariad of the nether verbal, pan's toot, the vegetable lamb of bartery, flight of the not crap. Munchkin of the black scrunch, damn sheesh, snippet, chaos who engulfed the world and broke the winds. Father, it stopped my inner dreams. To enter Babel. To enter Babel, one must follow Hebrew Bab Hel on the way from the Akkadian Bab Elul, the gate of God. But only ruins remain of mankind's attempt to converse one on one. A shorter journey ends at Merriam-Webster, the monument of an heretical sect that attempted to define all of his creation. The orthodoxy noted this curious feature. A word's meaning is determined by how it is used in relation to others, whose meanings are found likewise. The monument was built on no foundation. A search ensued for the loose word that it pulled out that caused indescribable destruction. And finally, banana, banana.
Thank you. Okay, Gary Kim's the board is an award-winning Scottish Canadian poet, translator, and academic. He is the author of the chapbooks Glean and Field Studies and the collection The Swaling, which just came out in 2023, and has received numerous prizes, including the Poetry International Prize, the Callum Gordon Award from the Scottish Book Trust, and the RBC Ron Rob Award from the Writers' Trust of Canada. He is currently translating the French Romanian philosopher Ian Herman's notebook for New York Review Books, a project that our mentor Richard Howard began. Patrick currently lives in Edinburgh, where he is a professor at the University of Edinburgh. About the swelling, Patrick Arrington's first collection traces the brittle boundaries between presence and absence, keeping and healing, cruelty and tenderness. In these poems, human voices whisper through the natural world. Here, language functions like a controlled burn, one that could at any moment preserve perfect or reduce to ash. Urgent resonance to the bone, the swelling burns to the ember edge of grief, memory, and control to find the wildness, wilderness, and wonder that remain. Please, everyone, help me welcome Patrick King. Uh, Thank you. Here the long edge of town, low winter fog, my flesh, its gathering. A stand of tamarack or wind rides pine in the distance, slow ghosts of a field on fire. Silence, I want so much to say. My breath, my offering. We are our bodies. Burning. It's a real uh, honor and a real terror to be between these two incredible poets. I, I'm in between rocks and hard places. I, this is it's, it's really, and I'm so so thrilled to be here in this space. I um, first uh, first ever like heard heard of this space, saw it uh, in pictures when. Um, a very good friend of mine, Max Ritvo, a mutual friend of ours, did his book launch here, and I unfortunately couldn't make it to that. And um, and very sadly, he's he's no longer with us. Uh, but it this place is just has this this history for me, and this and I I yeah can't say how, how thrilled I am to be here. This book, as as was sort of um, pointed out in the introduction, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, it, it takes the term, the swaling is, is a term for controlled burn, for the act of, of burning sort of very strictly controlled parts of landscape as a means of preventing out of control wildfires. And that, that first poem, that's the, the kind of epigraph poem, a kind of creation myth, vaguely in the sense of Heraclitus, who, who uh, wrote something to the effect of uh, all things are in exchange for fire. Uh, however, I'm going to go in a totally different direction and do it completely different poem um, that has nothing to do with fire and all of that. So I just gave you a long introduction for nothing. Um, this, this next poem begins with an epigraph, uh, which is actually my own invention, it. Um, uh, and it begins, uh, in quantum physics, it has been theorized that entangled subatomic particles might somehow affect one another without touching, regardless of the distance between them. Albert Einstein, in disbelief, called it spooky action at a distance. <laughs> This is spooky action at a distance. Rain hushing the last of the light. A sort that seems to touch everything. Slate, lip, leaves, as if by touching it might leave one last thing this time untold. In the last, the word was tender. In the next, spare. In the last lit flat across the street, I watch a couple wear their worn orbits around each other. He dries, she puts each thing away. Their hands never touch. Silence, a tie between. I think of my parents casting themselves like small coins into what seas they wouldn't say. I wouldn't say why I want to tell you this. 
Outside, a few drops drop on the gutters. My neighbors all held by lamplight from leaving, spin bags piling on the pavement, post that clots the door. One word, one word, one word. One thing fitting always precisely between, like bird song fits what quiet may come after this. Tell me there's just this world between us, that you're there on the other side, pressed to the cold of it. Can you feel that? Across the street and three floors below, a man stoops as he steps out, as if by stooping he might somehow make the drops stop head high. I'm going to actually put these on my microphone. I'm sorry, I don't actually have the book with me, but since we, I, I was thinking about Max in this space, and if I, I, I like to read a poem by someone who's, who's no longer able to read their own poems. And since, since I'm thinking a lot about Max, I, I would like to read his poem Afternoon, if you're all right with that, uh, from his book, Four Reincarnations, which if you haven't read, you should absolutely read his, all, all of his books are phenomenal. Afternoon. When I was about to die, my body lit up. Like when I leave my home, oh, like when I leave my house without my wallet. What am I missing? I asked, patting my chest pocket. And I'm missing everything living that won't come with me into this sunny afternoon. My body lights up for life, like all the wishes being granted in a fountain at the same instant, all the coins burning the fountain dry. I give my breath to a small bird-shaped pipe. In the distance, behind several voices haggling, I hear a sound like heads clicking together, like a game of pool played with people by machine. <laughs> I'm thinking about so there's a, a poem that actually came out of conversations that we had and, and my confessed terror of uh, doctors and, and hospitals, obviously phenomenal people, incredible people, but I find the spaces really quite quite terrifying and Max spent a great deal of his time there. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna read a poem that, that comes out of, out of that. This is a, it's called, They Don't Make Gods for Non-Believers. When I tell him I'm dying, my doctor says I'll die. Years and years from now, if I'm careful. So I will die then, I say, but carefully. After all, if it's worth doing, it's got to be worth doing carefully. And my doctor agrees, he should. All the same, you can be too careful, which is why I see him far less than his quote-unquote prudent. My doctor, I mean, not God. <laughs> him, I see so much more than should a devout non-believer, but never where I expect to. Great storms, great losses, and the like, rather in the pale residues left behind latex gloves or the soft patience of a painkiller. Maybe that's a sign I'm approaching the end. Or it may just be the voluntary <laughs> But my tongue again, the requisite ah, ah, as though comprehended. But let's face it, comprehension is not the issue. I mean, I can comprehend, like glass, that light with all its grit and sign comes apart into color, but that hardly warms this halogen, hardly amounts to understanding. My doctor thinks his is a look of understanding with all that plastic wisdom of sign and symptom, but understanding nothing of mine. Between you, me, and my God, my God, I've got a lot to cower from. Which I guess means I should put faith in one of us, but him I don't trust any more than my doctor or me or any more than anyone else so reliant on terror in their acolytes, shivering and braille skinned, deaths confessed to and calendared. He laughs at my swimming, hands swaddled in the two white light, reading my body, asking who I'll speak to when I write this, kneeling, pages closing more careful than hands on the bed. Um, I grew up in Alberta, Canada, um, but I've been living in Scotland for the past long while, and I, I managed to sneak in one Scottish word, my favorite Scottish word in that poem, uh, swithering, which is a term for being like uncertain and waffling, and, and it's just such a good word, and I was like, it's got to, it's got to find a way into, into a poem there. I ended up writing, as I, as I was writing the book, I, I'm assuming uh, other writers can have a similar, potentially similar kind of feeling where you write a first poem and you think you've got this and you, you've done it. And then 
later you find like it's something is still sort of sticking in your brain and you end up having to write a second poem. There are, the, the book is sort of full of these echo poems. Most of them maybe are just for me. But uh, one, I did write a pair uh, that actually are, are very much avowedly a pair. This is the second spooky action at a distance. For days it seemed like it rained, though it never did. Praying October sky of rasp as if in a foreign language, as if soil and slate and skin were terms it had learnt once in grade school, maybe, and unpracticed, forgot. I'm forgetting who it was I meant to tell this to. The words coming bit by bit apart against the air, I can feel whole vocabularies of you just there, past this language, this line. I've heard it said that one particle can feel another turning turning even on opposite ends of the universe, and I hold to that as something like hope, as if somehow just wondering might be enough. Days like these, I can't help but wonder about my mother, about the winds that flickered across her face when I raised my hand, leaving to wave goodbye. She used to tell me how much I'd come to look like him, my father, and I do, though we left him our whole lives ago as if I had grown like sharp wood into the wound of him. Yeah. Bare elms fit each flaw in the sky. The sky tonight is clear and irrevocable. Each and everything laid out beneath it like heirloom silver breath. Tell me whoever you are, whoever you are. Tell me you've saved one small vow of you. In a window across the street, a woman I'll never meet lights a single naked lamp and all the stars go out. Just going to do two more poems. Um, this uh, I, I ended up I found you know spooky action at a distance kind of poems. So it actually it was very much speaking to the COVID experience. Um, however, I was trying I was didn't think I was, and so I was didn't think I was writing COVID poems. There is one poem that is the only the only one that's an avowedly COVID poem. Um, and since we're still, it's still going on, um, but it's we're, we're out of our, our containment a little bit now. I'm going to read uh, a poem called Measures of Containment. So it would be helpful to see that it very much in like tight blocks here. So there's one line that actually references the shape. So it's sort of, sort of having a sense of that. Um, measures of Containment. I'm flickering through yet another dozen of pictures, posts, reposts, posting all the things that can be done while staying home, virtually anything, apparently, DIY, sourdough, stay home, save lives, each life displayed in its little box, each loss in its careful counted characters, and sometimes I worry that so much can be contained like this in a screen, a home. A poem, maybe. The way a body can be said to contain its pain. Everything you are in a lifetime. The meaning in a word. And for whatever reason I wish, and wildly, to let it out. Just once let life exceed the body that lives it. Let wild, let the line, this line maybe, reach just a bit too far to the... What if I have a word wrong? What if it's not so much in, but maybe through? And by through, I mean less in one side out the other, less beyond than by way of, or maybe even with, and for whatever reason, I wish, and wildly, for a way of reaching out to you, a hand with which to tell you that whatever it is, whatever you are going through right now, you can, you will live through this. Thank you all so much for being here, and um, thank you so much for inviting me, hosting me. I gave a, got to do a class today on metaphor, which that, that poem is very much in, in sort of keeping with, I think. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to be in this space and to have all of you here and be here with these, these incredible poets. I'm thoroughly daunted I'm in, in the best way, it's wonderful. Um, and this is also the last, uh, my last reading that I'm going to be doing in the US. I'm going back to Scotland tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So it feels very like this, it's a wonderful place to sort of conclude the, the um, tour, weirdly rock and roll kind of. Oh, it's, it's not a usual thing that happens, but it's been, it's been incredible. And, and this is the perfect, perfect way to, to wrap it up. So I'm going to finish with a very, very last poem in, in the book, uh, because it is a bit of a valediction. 
that is called never say never, say never. But here we are. Here where the page ends, hide bound, hand held and well the sleep. Morning, a little left to say, to sing, to let claim words like late leaves, like children. Always eventually the last time. All fathers someday set their daughters on their feet and never pick them up again. They flop your skin, never slip like weather off the wing, like the pale after touch gives up to color. What is there to do then but keep touch? It's not too much to ask, to leave just one choice unmade, unmade still warm, a last page unread, a wild wish wild and unwaited for, one small promise kept back. Last night's rain is curling the spruce, the timothy, the don't wait, not just yet. I'll glaze our will not bees in late long syllables until they're smooth and semi-precious. I'll set stones along your body. And when you wake, leave lightly. When you leave, come back. Thank you so much, Petra. Thank you for coming all the way here. Um, read for us and for bringing Max into the room, back into this room where he had the, the reading here that was so important to him. Um, and now it is my great honor <laughs> to, to welcome Rachel Haddis. She's recently retired from the Board of Governors Professor of English at Rutgers University of New York. She's the author of more than 20 books of poetry, essays, and translations. She studied classics at Carter and poetry at Johns Hopkins and Conklin at Princeton. She taught in the English department of the New York campus at Rutgers from 1981. She received the Guggenheim Fellowship in Poetry an Ingram Merrill Foundation grant in poetry, and an award in literature from the American Academy of the Institute of Arts and Others, among many other prizes and awards. About both guests, what is there I will not let go? Asked the introductory poem in both guests. Multi writes, like late Rembrandt, Rachel had us raised in the glow of candor and acceptance. Like late Bishop had his rights with the wonder of detail. She is that rare poet of whom we can say that even after 20 volumes, she composes with refreshing ease, warmth of craft, and a probing curiosity about the thin line between the lived life and the afterlife. In both guests, she writes from her personal Parnassus. It's really my honor to, to have Rachel Hattis here She's read for us so many times. She's such a beloved teacher at the Hudson Valley Writer Center. She's a wonderful friend. And um, as many of you know, she's a wonderful um, mentor and, and professor. So thank you so much, Rachel, for being here with us today. <laughs> I doubt if I will put Rembrandt out of business. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Jennifer is a great friend of poetry in the city, the neighborhood, the world at large, and we are very grateful. And I love hearing these two extremely gifted young poets. I forgot how funny Walter was. <laughs> and his, I left his book in Vermont, but I'm sorry I did, but I'll get back to it. Um, we also have a surprise guest. So... I'm probably going to read about eight poems people know what they're in for. Um, I don't, there have been so many books and I continue to see them commemorating the pandemic, which isn't really quite over. There's clearly a fertile time for writers. And if you can cast your mind back to Leap Day 2020, that was February 29th, 2020, I was in this room teaching a workshop on the lyric Leap. Jennifer and I came up with that. So I've, I've much enjoyed teaching at the table in this room. 
So the first poem I'm going to read is actually from Pandemic Almanac from 2022. I was putting together ghost guests and then the pandemic intervened. So I, in Pandemic Almanac, I do what I have never done before, probably won't do again. I give a place and a date to each poem. Mm -hmm. And this poem is actually, the title is, is the date, February 29th, 2020. As if we knew, but didn't know we knew, February 29th, <clears throat> midday, an extra day, an ordinary day, predictable even in being extraordinary. A bonus day in the old dispensation we couldn't guess was close to termination. Mm -hmm. When did we start to sense the great subtraction? Leap day then, and I was on my way to catch a train to go to Terrytown. People still had a schedule and a plan, mapping the hours to their destination to run a four-hour class on poetry, specifically tailored to the day on poems that performed a lyric leap, the way the mind hopscotches A to C or D or Z, a little lateral hop or skip, a sudden swerve, a syncopation. I waited for the train, Grand Central Station, tourists and travelers in circulation, all of them aimed at some desired location, throngs, chatting, texting, pausing to gaze up at the iconic ceilings, constellations. A pregnant woman in a scarlet coat posed for a photo with a selfie stick. Her baby must be four years old by now, or is it three? When I wrote this, it was six weeks old, but time passes. Waiting for my train, could I foresee crowds would soon be prohibited by law? Could anyone imagine the great hall would within weeks be scoured clean of all humanity? Just dust motes in the sun, idle tracks, an empty waiting room. Whoever sensed it didn't want to see. That extra day, that ordinary day, I got where I was going on the train and taught the lyric leap as per the plan. Then tired, happy, bathed in poetry, caught a train and traveled back again, retraced my steps, Grand Central one more time, maybe make that Grand Central one less time. Looking back now, I can see I saw that leap day when we leapt with poetry, the cold blue morning light, the dappled sky, the river silver gray as we rode by. But what no one was prepared to see not quite a harbinger since it was there already. No, a searchlight raked the air invisibly, masked by morning's glare. That searchlight still is circling everywhere and everyone's a target, you and me. And yet with the bewilderment and fear, upheaval on a scale we scarcely see, although we sense it in the air, companion to our stunned anxiety, something else persists invisibly something that isn't going anywhere, something that is still here. And a much shorter poem from Ghost Guest is a poem I found myself writing sort of in preparation for the Lyric Leap workshop. And Alicia and I were talking, and Shalom and I were talking about what makes a poet a poet, a lyric poet, and I think one thing is the inability or unwillingness to think in a straight line. We <laughs> often go zigzagging. Um, or maybe that's only true of me. I don't know. But, <laughs> so, lyric leap. The fizzing spark, the lateral leap, the sideways skitter, mind the gap. Fugitive dream recalled mid-morning, deja vu pouncing without warning. Unexpected recollection, serendipitous digression, meandering at an angle, pun that stops you before you've begun, tattered palimpsest, apex, puzzle that stymies you in your tracks, lacuna, hiatus, sidebar, sudden swerve, and you were far along already towards surprise. Pause a second and surmise, your destination was where? One sideways step may get you there, your wings still crumpled, half asleep, one unassuming lyric leap. <laughs> I think I caught a few of them in the work read by these two wonderful young poets before me. So um, I'm going to be 75 years old a month from tomorrow. It's hard for me to believe. <laughs> we made it this far, right? Um, 
And you know, they say the past is a country where they it's a foreign country, they do things differently there. Mm -hmm. And when you I don't know who said that, but it's a famous saying. Maybe someone can tell me. And when you're old enough, you can, in an almost prosaic way, describe a few things from your childhood, and they, it's, they seem very foreign, which is something I think Lowell was doing in Life Studies, which I respect and understand more as I get older. So I'm going to read two poems about or from my New York childhood. Some things may seem familiar and some may not. This is called Rainbow Parfait. At the end of every summer, Labor Day coming, school about to begin, the family used to go to the Columbia Faculty Club for dinner, our first night back. Air conditioning, clinking ice, waiters in buff jackets, view from the 19th floor of Butler Hall out over Morningside Park. What we talked about, our father and mother and my sister and I, all hot and tired after the eight, nine, 10 hour drive down from Vermont, is lost to the melt of memory. The ritual dessert, though, sticks with me. Rainbow parfait, a multicolored column of sherbet stacked in a tall frosted glass and topped with a maraschino cherry. <laughs> you had to poke and dig to get to the bottom. Even the long-handled spoon was cold. A lot of life feels horizontal. Time stretches out and you can look ahead. Lately, though, before I fall asleep, my impulse is to tunnel back and down. It is possible to be the archaeologist of one's own past, as if the sleeper, wakened now alert, was perched at the top of the trench, peering at something shining down below and excavating down, down, down through the strata of decades with a long-handled spoon. My older sister, who's very factually oriented, told me that I had the address of the faculty club wrong. <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing that happens. <laughs> um, this other poem is, um, again, just really recollections from those early days. This is called Four Sixty. <laughs> we lived on the ground floor. The doorman, Earl, sat in the lobby. From our, from our living room through the wall, we could hear Earl's explosive sneezes, <laughs> loud and clear. The knob of our apartment's front door was big and brass, and Earl would vigorously grasp and twist it, and with rag and smelly, smelly polish, noisily buff that knob until it gleamed. It always gleamed. I knew that brass polish was poison. From our side of the door, the knob would visibly turn as Earl twisted it, apparently of its own accord, untouched by human hand. Visitors didn't understand. Who was out there? What ghostly messenger was rattling away unseen on the other side of the door? Who, sent from where, was trying to get in? The only polite thing was to ignore that uncanny energy. <laughs> A lifetime later, it is clear to me, or at least less murky, I understand Earl as a harbinger from an undiscovered land. White gloves and can of polish, courtesy. Don't fall down now, he did not, he'd admonish me. Why should I fall, I wonder. I was five, six, seven. I was agile and alive. I roller skated up and down outside Grant's tomb or on Riverside Drive. It was the old ladies. These were the 50s teetering along on their high heels, hatted and gloved with seams in their stockings, and with glassy-eyed fox furs draped over their massive chests, who might fall down. Not me. <laughs> Was it because it would have been rude to warn them that Earl kept warning me? <laughs> Mortality has caught up with those ladies and with him, rattled their doorknobs, it was time, gone in. That lobby was so cold in wintertime, I still remember the stiff wind off the river so strong that neither Earl nor any tenant could shut the outer door at all. Eventually, Earl, everyone will fall. <laughs> I think in honor of Walter's etymologies, I'm going to read an uncollected poem 
which I started working on when Shalom and I got together 10 years ago, and I've been fiddling with it and swithering with it. Um, no, my it, it certainly doesn't do etymology the way Walter does, but it, it takes off from etymology and it's called yoke. And also, I mentioned a dictionary, though not the Merriam Webster, but something a lot like that. Today, I woke wondering about the word yoke. Old High German, Old Norse, Latin, Greek, Sanskrit. The line drawing in the Random House College Dictionary, a pair of ox heads, patient, uneasy. The image of the team we saw last week at the Caledonia County Fair. That was August. Labor Day came and went. School starts today. In my course on myth, the introductory lesson will be twofold. First, unlearn whatever you thought you knew in order to, second, understand how much you knew already from sources long forgotten and familiar. Heads on a single pillow, I wait beside you. Today's not only the first day of school, for you it's one more court date, the divorce, unyoking, yesidio in Greek. From years of stiff neck partnership, a team struggling to pull in opposite directions. Time to get up, put on our city clothes and public faces. Time to venture out to the simmering sidewalk and then underground to catch the train to classroom or to courtroom, while all day long our sweet new yoke holds firm. And of course, the letter A or Aleph or Alpha comes from the drawing of an ox's head. I forgot to put in the poem. <laughs> um, there are quite a few poems about teaching. I'm just going to read one in honor of my retirement and then a couple more and we're done. Um, this is called The Last Lecture Hall. And like a lot of the poems I've been writing, it incorporates a little language from other poets. Um, in this case, from a maybe not terribly well-known poem by Longfellow. The last lecture hall. Theaters that were never ours, classrooms empty and refill. We cross the stage and disappear. Feverish categories blur, generic distinctions, what for? The empty theater becomes a lecture hall. A classroom morphs into a forest, murmuring with voices. Words pelt down like rain, or rise like mist and disappear. Theater, classroom, maple, fir, feverish categories blur, presences pressing through the wall of the phenomenal. A leopard's padding down the hall. Tiger-masked students fill the seats of the amphitheater. The old professor looking out over the upturned faces said, you are all allegorical figures to me. I will not learn your names. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> Back to the first. Did the students laugh? Tragedy, satire, comedy, genres are deciduous. Modes blur, leaves wither and fall. The leaves of memory seem to make a mournful rustling in the dark. Longfellow, the fire of driftwood. Lights go out in the theater. We stumble out, class is over. <laughs> now, that was apparently something Kenneth Burke said late in his career. I have no idea how the students reacted. <laughs> um, this is an uncollected mythological poem that I had the pleasure of reading on a Zoom talk with Alicia Smalling. You might have noticed she's here, <laughs> um, where we were both talking about poetry in relation to myth. Whoops, I think I need to get that one. I think everybody knows the story of Venice, Achilles' mother, dipping him in the river Styx to make him immortal, but her mistake was she held on to his heel. She forgot to dip that. And someone in a, a Zoom discussion group I've been in, a kind of literal minded person. Why did she do that? Why did she think that? Yeah. <laughs> um, and someone else said, 
I realized when I was washing the dishes that if I was holding one dish in between my finger and thumb, it would never get clean. So this this is open up and ask Mary to confusion. So this this poem is called the Thumb of Thetis. <laughs> Grasping him by one little foot to dip him in the mystic river, Thetis, how could she forget? Overlooks this that where her thumb presses his flesh. He still is dry instead of drenched in deathless wet, hence subject to mortality. When her baby is a man, that tiny disc of naked skin will let the fatal arrow in. This is where the wound will come. One vulnerable spot is all it takes. We say Achilles heel. His mother Thetis anxious clutch, immortal hand and tender touch. Though less renowned in song and story, still plays its part as allegory, gesture of love and dread and hope, and also absent-mindedness. <laughs> the thumb of Thetis is a trope for unintended consequence. A goddess mother's strategy to bestow immortality, the thumb of Thetis on the scales is not enough. <laughs> Struck by the arrow to his fall, which nobody knows about. Earlier in his infancy, she tried to burn his death away, to purge him of mortality. Fire, water, armor, nothing can finally protect her son. As Thetis knows, he'll die, and soon. The poem, which features her laments, but not her earlier attempts to keep him safe, omits as well the arrows speeding to the kill. Homer's theme is not the scene of start or end, but what's between. The agony of love and loss, Thetis, Achilles, Patroclus. How beautiful her proleptic grief that the tree, her son's young life, so flourishing, will so be so brief, so soon and cruelly to be cut. She holds him by his little foot. Mm -hmm. And I think two more if we can do that. We have time then? Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to read. A poem about teaching on Zoom. Again, there have been many poems. Mary Jo Salter has a very fine sequence of sonnets and the name of her new book called Zoom Rooms, <laughs> where the Zoom room really becomes life itself. And this is this is more specific. This was also in Pandemic Almanac. And I don't think it's meant to be either an attack or a defense. It's just sort of a phenomenology in, in my experience. I can find it's called In the Cloud. I think I owe Shalom the title. I'm very, very bad with first titles. Mm -hmm. And the first line of this poem is I made a list and I called the poem the list, but that was not the right title. <laughs> In the Cloud, New York, December 2020. I made a list I can't find now. Where did all my folders go? Of words my students didn't know. Turmeric. Cultus, fallacy, cadence, meringue, antigone, last but not least, Persephone, are just a few that stick with me, plucked from the poems that we read. I tried to stay a week ahead between September and December. Many more I don't remember. But think of all the words they knew or thought they knew. I thought so too. Thinking too hard though doesn't do. Words deeply pondered start to freeze, as when before our tired eyes, Zoom stalls and stops and no surprise, leaving a dark screen, a blank hour to fill with after and before. Nonsense syllables devour denotations, happy, sad, joyful or lonely, good or bad. What does this mean to you, I said. What does beautiful really mean, I asked them, as I tried to lean into the non-committal screen, <laughs> scanning until my eyes were sore for the soul in each black square. Were there really people there? Did each, did each name hide a secret face, sheltering somewhere in place, some unimaginable space? Each word they may have learned from me in gen ed, reading poetry, carries its meaning quietly. Concealed behind the livid glow of all we learned, we didn't know. Alone together, here we are, stranded in our shared nowhere, marooned in space, while free from time, meanings proliferate and chime as words unfettered 
dance and rhyme. Alone Together is the name of a wonderful book by my classmate Sherry Turkle, who teaches cognitive science at MIT. And I think it was a pre-pandemic book about the effects of technology. So I'm going to finally read um, the title poem, Ghost Guest. And again, there are lines you might or might not recognize from the canon of English poetry. I could do scare quotes, but I don't think I will. <laughs> Ghost Guest. I sometimes think I recognize the face of my own death. Knowing it is nearer makes me feel it ought to be familiar, a neutral guest I've seen somewhere before. Even if it's not a face I know, can it be ignored, that shadow presence quiet in a corner? And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. Which is the lesser of two evils here? Which the least boorish way to be a host? Who is hosting whom? If I'm a host, I'm also just as much a guest, a ghost. What hard heard of, ghost guest. So, Death, I'll acknowledge you. I'll be polite, hand you a drink, and let you circulate and talk with others. You will cycle that. Precisely. At my back, I always hear and do not hear and see and do not see, know and do not know. You'll catch up with me. Since I think I know you from somewhere, why should I be so sure that you do not know me at least as well, my length of days and my Achilles heel? which in each person's in a different place. Sometimes I think I recognize your face. Thank you. You were great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're fortunate to have Alicia Stallings, whom I met in 1999 at Sewanee when she was a child. <laughs> and uh, she, she's ready to read a poem to us. She's very <laughs> nice to be here today. Um, sorry to be crash your <laughs> reading. Um, I know everyone always wants to hear yet yeah, one more poem. <laughs> um, I just like to say it's wonderful to be here. Um, I have been invited here in the past and it hasn't worked out. It's wonderful, sort of serendipitous. Uh, to show up here today and to say kalantaxi though to all the new books, um, which is a Greek wish uh, for new books or ships with regard <laughs> to um, And thinking of uh, Rachel and uh, talking about the lyric leap, I thought I'd read this new poem because it's kind of about lyric leaps and it is called Hairs. In 13 years of walking the mountain path, hairs have been scarce. I've done the math. In all this time, I've seen maybe four or five. The droppings I've seen that prove they're here at the crossroads at the turn. I picture one dished ear swiveling left, then right, as for a satellite, while the buck sits and lifts his stone axe head one of his sparring mitts tentatively folded toward his angular chest, alert at rest. Partridges, or chuckers, I often run across. They take off in a ruckus Greeks likened to flatulence, like rapidly deflating balloons. There's an etymology. <laughs> uh, if ambulating, a matron and her brood bustle down the hill, ignoring the rude interloper, they will pretend to putter till spluttering a flutter. I'm not left agog by then, but for the hair almost as big as a dog, there's no way to prepare for the huge unlikelihood. By the time I've understood something drastic has happened, it bounds into the bushy mastic pursued by ghost hounds. The light's about to fail when it turns tail and the two black tips of its ears bob away to see ones to eclipse the rest of the day. Hairs are not born blind. They are a watchful kind. I've seen, I bet, more often than I see. Right now, a leveret might be eyeing me, wound up with alarm to start forth from its grassy form and add to the slim count of hairs I've seen on the mountain. The amount might double in 13 more years. Who can say? 
this one leaps away. So much to all of the poets who read. If you'd like to have come up to the front and have a couple of questions, and then we'll we'll sell books. Um, the village bookstore is here, and all of the poets' books are on sham. Um, Walter, <laughs> okay, I have it. <laughs> but, um, in 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 first writing a poem, what what strikes you? It's about the, the, the rhythm of some of a line or of a thought that makes it clear to you that this is going to be a formal poem, that there's a rhyme scheme implied, or or do you set out intentionally with the idea, okay, today's a good day for a system? I mean, you know, like 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 does does the um I have a, a, a good mentor teacher who insists that the poem will tell you what what it wants to be, how it wants to come into being. And that's that's what that the most important thing to pay attention to is, is how the poem wants to come out. So if you if you think, oh, I've got 13 lines, damn, I'm just one away from the sonnet. I mean, you know, like it, I mean that's that's in, in his estimation an improper way to tell the poem what you want it to be. And so I'm very curious about about how how does how does Formal verse or metrically lined verse come into being without that sense of intention about how to craft, or is this a, a quality of revision where where you're where you started a poem and and in that process of revision it becomes clear that that, well, that there's a rhyme scheme implied. Is that any any please help? Most of the poems in my book are prose. But which I guess is a is there an intention behind that then? Yeah, because they're ripping off of the dictionary entry. Um, which I used to not I kind of still don't like prose poetry. Um <laughs> and then I read a wonderful book by Jeffrey Hill called Merchant Hymns. Yes. Which is super weird and fun. Absolutely. Um and I was like, and then for the poems that aren't prose poems, like that were about him, for instance, um, you know, the etymology is just kind of like opened my mind in the direction and I was like how can I replicate the idea of taking one thing and folding it and it turns into something else but it's made of the same thing. Um, so doing the anagrams and the haiku were one solution to that. I hmm. Most of my writing is about convincing myself I'm at no point ever writing. Uh, I find writing really scary, and so most of it is like I'm making notes, and then I'm editing notes, and I think so. I certainly don't have a thought, a plan in mind when it comes to the beginning. I think then you, I start finding connections, and part of building poems is finding these connections. These thoughts build on each other; they move in a certain way. There's leaps. There's mm -hmm. um, and so for me, yeah, and then and then. Formal stuff tends to come very late. That would be like, oh, in the in the revision, in the revision stage, I'm starting to find, oh, this this feels like it's it's working. And I kind of find. Well, I noticed off. many of your poems were couple. Yeah, yeah. And there's there's something about the. I mean, there's a combination of visuals, and there's there's a combination of uh, like the thought reverse thought thing of the the couplet that really worked in a number of poems. Um, mm -hmm. It's a whole bunch of different. I did, I mean, yeah, and stuff like rhythm that that tends to be, yeah, I'm, I'm nearing that. There was one that took me eight. I wrote years and years ago the first draft of, and then it it came very late that I realized the ending had to be in perfect ambit and ambit. And that's a very, very late thought where I was like, oh, the reason mm -hmm. that this never felt quite right is because it was hovering so close to, mm -hmm. to, to the pentameter and, and then it, but it wasn't. Until I moved a couple of words around, and then it, it was, uh, and it felt right. So yeah, it's a, it's a really slow um, back and forth, I think, between both intention and then finding self discovery, I guess. But 
Yeah, I mean, your your question was um, very detailed and had a lot of <laughs> a lot of possibilities. A lot of struggle involved. <laughs> Yeah. Say quoting the poem of militias, all of the above, you know, right. Right. not yeah. only for different poets who operate differently, but for any one poet. I've been mm -hmm. writing poems for 60 years, and I couldn't answer your question with any precision. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like quoting a few people. Marianne Moore said, Ecstasy affords the occasion, and expediency determines the form. Mm -hmm. Whatever expediency means, like you're trying to write a sonnet, but that's that's in the revision process. I would agree with Patrick. And um, I think Schiller said somewhere, you know, pay attention to your gut. Don't don't try to get the rhymes right right away. And Jay Cooper, a, a wonderful Upper West Side under recognized poet who died some years ago, said, um, "Poetry is the trouble of the soul. You know, whatever is bothering you is going to go into poetry." Which reminds me of T. S. Eliot saying, "Well, wasteland is just rhythmical rumbling." <laughs> so all of these things, I think and write. I, it's not an effort for me to do iambic pentameter; it's sort of an effort not to. So, but it takes a lot of experience and time to realize some poems are too long and some are too diffuse, or there's too much leaping. My own revision tends to be squeezing the flab out of a poem, whatever that might mean, the, the flab of its substance or the flab of its style. But I, I think it's an endlessly interesting question that there's not a simple answer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have that might cover it. What's the um length of time the shortest and the longest between revisions of your poems? Patrick, you mentioned one that yeah, know, yeah, it was years ago? eight years. Eight years. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm just curious about that. No one answer. I mean, yeah. I think I started writing Yoke in 2014, but sometimes I'll go back to a poem in some musty folder from 2010. Um, I, and often I do up to 16 or 17 revisions, sometimes several in a single day, or sometimes they can sit. I think Maxine Human said that she cool like a pie on a windowsill so uh, again no no rules and not all poems need revision sometimes they seem to be perfect they come out easily um it's not really about revision but uh like the first poem in the book not the other one um i wrote that in like 2015 and then didn't think anything of it and i literally just started to say like how it looks when these stacks still hurts and how great that are so that's like a poem for me. Um, and then like a bunch of years later, I was looking at the poem again and I realized it was telling a story. Um, because when you go from like Nahuatl to uh, Spanish to English, you were telling a story about how the word public works in this book, uh, which is much different. Um, but obviously telling that story in a totally bizarre, weird way that no one teaches three words in this interpretation. So it wasn't necessarily revision, but Having some sort of distance and time, rereading it again, it like unlocks something that allowed me to write the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of, so I guess I was revising how I was uh, approaching it. And that was very creatively um, fruitful. And even even poets who are much younger than me uh, are are they're functioning as curators of their own work, curators of drafts. You know, don't throw it away. Revisit it. If if you don't, who will? <laughs> and I'm, I'm getting better at that myself. And sometimes a piece of a poem will work, or even a single line will work. So, this is just a little um, detailed question, but along the lines of revision, one, I can't remember which I was reading along, which of your poems you, there were some words that were different in the printed one than the version you were reading. And I was wondering which one is the most. Recent. Oh gosh. You mean a poem you saw somewhere else? No, no. In your book. Oh. One of the poems you read from your book. Yeah. When you were reading it. Oh, and I read words that weren't there. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so it's my class. Yeah, you know, some words were different. No, I think I thought that at first, but then they were really so different that I don't think it was just I can't remember which poem. You no, know, I mean if I had to come out of the book, I would see. But that's interesting. Yeah. So but not consciously like. You know, well, it can happen that in reading a poem, you realize such and such a word is better. 
<laughs> I've often, I've been to numerous poetry readings and often a poet will make a small change which might or might not be intentional. Right. So, but I, I thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I, I have one question that we like to kind of talk to all of the poets and tell them poems. Um, the students who are putting together their first collection. Um, any advice that you have for people who are, they have a manuscript, what advice do you have for them in terms of editing and um, well, I presenting it? I was just a wish it too. I don't yeah. know. I don't, I, it seems to me that Walter's book is very original and very much. Mm -hmm. All itself, all the poems have the same DNA. Or and and Patrick has obviously worked for a long time, and is very self-critical. Mm -hmm. So I I'd say you know don't publish your first book too fast. Yeah. But Alicia, do you have anything to add to that? about organizing? Yeah, just about organizing, editing, um, order no, link. I think you know if you're if you're an unpublished poet and you're sending manuscripts out to contests and stuff. You shouldn't worry about the order too much. You really should just put very good poems at the beginning and some very good poems at the end because the editor will have suggestions. Um, you know, things can be reordered once the book is accepted in publication. I think too much time, I mean, my last book of original poems, I just put them in alphabetical order. <laughs> and that were by the way. I would say, to my own mind, no, but it's like not your own, probably not your own book. So that way, it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, no, so, I, okay. uh, to remind yourself that it's probably not your only book, and that it's okay if not everything goes in it. Because to me, there was like, oh, I need to cover every topic I've ever been interested in. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, my first book, I was absolutely sure that was it. I went in all the way where that stuff that could be used. It wouldn't be another opportunity. Yeah, and in terms of what Alicia said, I mean, I know that when I was talking to other people about the first book or whatever, really sap them with the first poem, as if poetry readers work that way. It's not a page turn. It's not a feature reading. You know, I, I think you know, I think I, it was brilliant that life was alphabetical by title. Yeah. I, I don't even I don't read books of poems in order. I don't say I, <laughs> I know a lot of attention and time has been put into that, but I kind of I read the short poems, the the lyric and the long. There's not a plot. I mean, Walter could have said my book is organized: avocado, banana, onion. Yeah, it starts with grocery shopping. Yeah. <laughs> But thank you. Each of you are such a wonderful presence and the sense of humor you brought. It's so wonderful. And I kind of was thinking how maybe just reading it when it's silent is different from sort of performing and reading it aloud. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Like if you missed during the pandemic the opportunity to meet in person and read, or if you experience your work in a different way, you know, a text on the page versus. It's really yeah, a pleasure yeah. to read aloud. It's also a pleasure. Poetry adapted well to Zoom compared to a lot of the other arts. Right. I mean, if, if they both have something to say for them. But, you know, if poetry is not fun, and I know we're not talking about spoken word poetry or poetry slams here, but if poetry isn't fun or in some way entertaining, what's the point? You know, we're not doing it to get rich. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing it for love of the art, I think. And that's that's what brings us together. I'm doing this very rich. This is news to me, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a wonderful image. I've already almost forgotten it, but seeing the woman lighting a candle yeah. from a window. Yeah. You know James Merrill's The Broken Home, no. which is the sonnet sequence he wrote when he was maybe about your age, okay. probably about his parents' divorce. And mm -hmm. he's seeing a family and a child behind a lighted right. window. And it's a poem about gayness and loneliness. Mm. It's a wonderful. I mean, I didn't feel like you were imitating it, but it sort of rang a bell. Oh, that's great. There's always some of the echoes, right? And yeah. it was nice of you to talk about, yeah, having echoes of other people's work in, in your work. And, and, and uh, yeah, I like performing to me, honestly, performing live is 
is different. Like there, there is something about about being in a space, and I think maybe to to do with your slight word changes, or you know, like when you're in the room, you are always adapting to that space, and so I perform. It's different every time, and I feel like I discover new things in my work as as you like get into the rhythm of it and the way that it's it's sort of negotiating with this space. And there's something really wonderful about that actually communicating. And there's people. the serendipity of the chemistry of yeah. every of our yeah. and, and then yeah. that rips on too. Yeah. Of, like other yeah. 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 I remember I read here with two other poets some years ago, Gardner McFall and Sophia Jama, who was also a Rutgers New York student. And completely unplanned, we were all reading poems about our fathers, about right. the dead fathers. And we were all quite different poets, but that's the way it fell out. Mm -hmm. That's quantum entanglement. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Can I say something just to Patrick? Mm -hmm. um, in your remarks, and someone in your poetry, but in all of your remarks, you talk about how terrified you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And instead of terror for your next reading, uh -huh. I would say uh, more awestruck. Yeah. And you remind me of Moses. Standing barefoot before the burning wood. Wow, but can you bear with something else? Better than this. Let's see. Okay. Shoes are coming off. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's good to me. Thank you very much. Yeah, awestruck, absolutely. It's the word. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Rachel, I like that you brought up the, the resonances and the um, similarities, the way you're pulling mm. up to each other, the mythology. Patrick Lurie was a lot of personal mythology and the etymology. It was a really interesting combination of poems that we heard today. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you to the audience. Thank you so much. This is very interesting.